Yeah. yeah. Literally, the story of how I got in here is very short. I was telling a friend, I was like, hey, I had this great idea. I'm going to start having two laundry baskets. One of them's white, one of them's blue. Okay. And when I change clothes, when I disrobe to take a shower or whatever, I'll, put, I'll pre-sort lights into the white basket, darks into the dark basket. All right. My laundry speed is like three times what it was. I mean, the, the, uh, the like folding, whatever, is just as long, yeah. but at least like the checking for stains or whatever, like that pre-sorting process is so much easier. And he said, Rob, I think you'd like operations management. I said, what's <laughs> operations management? The rest is history. Really? Uh, pretty much. And I, I, I'd never heard of it. And he's like, that's the kind of thinking that we look for in operations management. Um, and then I had a professor, my first semester actually, um, who incidentally is from New Orleans um, or from outside of New Orleans. Um, and Dr. Emmett Lodry, uh, who recruited me to the PhD program. And at first I brushed him off, but um, he won me over. So, so you didn't um, plan on getting a PhD right away? No. Or like at all? At all. No. The funny story is my sister is a doctor. So my dad's a doctor and my sister is a doctor. Like medical and doctor or just paid like, okay. Medical doctors. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so my sister's quite a bit older than I am. And so I watched her go through medical school when I was in middle school. <laughs> okay. And I was like, oh my God, this looks awful. Like, why would anyone want to be a doctor? This is terrible. And, um, you know, and nobody goes to medical school because, or because, or no one goes to, gets to be a doctor so they can go through medical school, right? Yeah. No one does that. Yeah. Um, but I was like, no, no, I don't want to do anything that hard. That looks, that looks terrible. And so when, when they were initially recruiting me to be it, to get a PhD, I was like, okay, that sounds hard. I'm not sure I want that, <laughs> but it doesn't sound as hard as getting a medical degree. Um, I haven't decided if that's true or not because I've only experienced <laughs> one. So I don't know how to assess that, but I do know that, that the statistics of people finishing a PhD without uh, like clinical depression is very small. Really? Oh, it's, yeah. it, it, people crying in the office was like, not, it's not, I'm not to say we didn't care. Like people would go over and like comfort the student who's having a mental breakdown, but it wasn't like, Oh my God, what's happening? It was like, well, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's uh, their turn. <laughs> <laughs> it's their turn. Exactly. Yeah, well, she's her first year. Like, the reason that she hasn't seen us cry is because we've been here for three years and she just started. Like, <laughs> wow, that's, I didn't even think of it that way. Yeah, but it was like, it was an awesome group. I loved my coworkers, my classmates, my colleagues were incredible. Um, we keep in touch. One of them was like a hobbyist painter and incredible. So I actually had her paint my mother a Christmas present one time. Aww. Uh, yeah, it was, it was just like such a great group of people and it was multinational. So it was a hint of what I was going to get in Chicago because I was the only white person. Really? I loved it. It was incredible. Because wow. Alabama, think about it. What do you expect it to look like? I got you in a word, monochromatic. It's a bunch of white people and that is pretty stale. There's uh, not a lot of Hispanics down there, if I, right? No, because they all come to New York, Chicago, Miami. LA yeah so I, I I got to I got various experiences that were like finally not just white bread which mm -hmm. was um it's like that was awesome you know all over the world um you know I have an African-American uh, advisor mm -hmm. and then my my like instructors are from like the Middle East or from Eastern Europe oh, or, wow. uh Asia um Let's see, India. Did I have any actually like true? I guess I didn't have any true African professors. I had South American professors. That's disappointing. Well, and our and like okay, Australia and Antarctica. I was about to be like, I'm missing continents. Okay, I'm missing three. So, um, yeah. but there's no penguins. So <laughs> there's no penguins. Yeah, it's not gonna happen. Um, so after you got accepted into the PhD program, what was the process like besides the coffee and crying? <laughs> besides those two very big. Um, well, so. I had a, it was a little awkward because I had, uh, I had finished an undergraduate in business, but that didn't give me all the classes I needed to get a, to get a PhD in business. Oh, wow. Um, because it's, it's very heavily math based for operations management. So for an undergraduate, we pretty much will say like, here's the math, you're welcome. Now here's the formula to use. But yeah. then for the PhD, I have to prove that formula. I have to be able to derive it myself and like do the, do the calculus and prove I had an, I remember an exam question um, where they gave us, because like the, the basic formulas are too easy. Like that's trivial to prove. 
And so they gave us a harder version that we'd never seen before. And we had like two hours to figure it out. Oh, wow. Just go. Wait, and so you go in blind and they're like, all right, be free. Do it. Yeah. Oh I mean, for that exam. So there are qualifying exams every year. Mm -hmm. And so you have a year of classes and you're taking a mix of PhD level and master's level courses. The theory being that PhD is helping you to do research mm -hmm. and master's courses are helping you to teach because you're going to have to do both. And so I got a master's degree while at my PhD because I needed the master's degree to be able to teach. Wow. And then you need the PhD to do research. Basically it's kind of how they structured it. So you're doing both at the same time, which is exhausting. Ooh, that's and then insane. Yeah, it, it's not fun, <laughs> but there's good news. And that is because they're expecting you to be coming, you know, like with skills, mm -hmm. experience often, and maybe a family, they pay you a stipend. So you, your living expenses are taken care of. In exchange though, you have to serve as a, as a teaching assistant for 20 hours a week. Wow. So, uh, so that, yes, yeah, so you're working your butt off on classes, trying to figure out all this math stuff and you know, I, I, I didn't, I didn't take calculus until I was a senior because they didn't need it. And all of a sudden I needed calculus to, to, to get my PhD. So I finished mostly my undergrad courses, but I was still in school because I had to take calculus and stuff. So I was in this like weird waiting period. I like sat in on a PhD course just to see what it was like. And, mm -hmm. but I didn't do the homeworks or the exams. I just like sat there. It was, it was weird. Dude, that's um, so exhausting. Like yeah. I almost want to feel sorry. Like, holy guacamole, you know? Well, yeah, and it's what the funny part about it was looking back, being in grad school was a lot easier than being a faculty member. Really? And I remember them telling us that, and they wouldn't tell us that very often, but only if we complained too much. Like, you guys got it easy right now. Just relax. Yeah. Because everything that you're doing is new, mm -hmm. and anyone who's a novice at something will struggle. Mm -hmm. unless you're a prodigy that's what being a prodigy means is that you just skip that part yeah and that's the vast majority of people don't don't do that i mean 99.99 oh. percent .99 don't do that even really smart people i can tell you i was in a room full of smart people and everyone's struggling that's just that's just what it is and it was it was really difficult but the, the as you go you just get so much better and so much faster you do better work in half the time wow. and I remember the most, the best example I can give you is I was given an assignment by my advisor and we're starting a new project. And so he tasked me with, uh, he, he gave me a week to try to understand what exists in the literature right now. And I looked at him like, I was, like he was crazy. Was like, what? How am I just going to like understand the literature in a week? And so what I did is I spent like 20 or 30 hours on Google Scholar reading papers. Ugh. And I turned in a report, it was like several pages long of like summaries of each of the articles or whatever. And he just looked at me like, what the hell is this? And he literally just put it to the side on his desk. And like he talked about it for a few minutes, but then he just put it to the side of his desk and we just started over. He's like, this is useless. What, why, why and, and again, he's an incredible person. I respect him immensely. He was not being like, you're an idiot. This is useless. He was just like, this is not what we need. This is not going to do it. And so I wasted, you know, like 30 hours. I didn't waste because I learned better how to do a literature review. And so now I can, I mean, so we sat in his office and we accomplished more in like 45 minutes than I did in 30 hours. And that's, that's, that's the thing is like, at first you're just, you don't know what to do. And so you're floundering. Mm -hmm. And as you build experience and gain like, and learn how to do it, I mean, it, it can become much, much, much faster. So what happens is the easiest year workload wise is the first year. And then they ratchet it up the second year, ratchet it up the third year, ratchet up the fourth year. And then a, actually being a faculty is quite a bit harder than that. But because you get better, the perceived difficulty just kind of stays mental. But, you know, I mean, it's <laughs> at least it's becoming more efficient. Yeah. That, so another to... example, I started learning how to video edit. First video took me four hours. Yep. I can usually edit a video now in like five minutes yeah. for yeah. my teaching purposes because it's very minimal. It's like cuts, you know, very yeah. easy. Yeah, stuff. yeah, yeah. yeah but gonna... that's the kind of time, like, but you, you have to start at the four hours to be able to get to the part where you can do it in five minutes. So, and I try to tell my, I tell my students that all the time, like you are in the hard part. Anything is new. Anything that's new is hard. 
Yeah. Solving a Rubik's Cube is completely baffling if you don't know how to solve it. And once you do, my record is one minute and 42 seconds. It's not actually that hard. It just looks really hard. <laughs> and if you don't have someone to teach you, it is really hard. And then uh, you spend a few months on it. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, you know, you're like timing yourself and you, you can do it in under two minutes consistently. You know, the world record is like four seconds. Wow. Incredible. Oh, right. Because they like look at it for a second, right? Yeah. So you're allowed, you're allowed to look at it. Yeah. And then uh, you put it, put it down on this like weighted pad thing. Yeah. And then, and then you yeah. touch the thing and like, and it stops when you slap the table again. Yeah. I, uh, I've only seen one person, what is it called? Defend your thesis? Something like that? Yeah. So I've only seen one. So I didn't know exactly what it took to become a, get your doctorate. But that sounds exhausting. And I know I was having this discussion with somebody that, what's a nice way to say it? They don't have any uh, collegiate experience. I don't know, mm -hmm. I guess. Sure. And he was like, oh, it's not that hard. It's not that hard. And He's the type of person where he knows everything. And it, I don't know, man, it's, it's annoying. 